name is Tracy Delaney, and I'm with the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. And just want to thank all of you for being on this call. We're, we're really thrilled to be hosting this. And for those of you that um, are not familiar with our organization, we are a collaboration of nine health departments in Southern California. And the work that we do um, focuses on upstream chronic disease prevention. So we focus mainly on policy systems and environmental changes. Next slide, seat, please. You can see, next one. You can see our membership here, the, the membership health departments. Um, and together, geographically, we cover about 60% of the state's population. And we realize that many of the health issues that we are um, facing really do cross our individual jurisdictions, things such as greenhouse gas emissions and, and regional food systems, just to name a couple. So we came together, and next slide, um, working together to forge a multi-sector alliance so that all of our communities, our residents can be healthy and active. So the priority initiatives that we're working on uh, in our initiative are around uh, transportation, food systems, and data. And the genesis of this call actually um, started out, next slide, um, at the S3 conference that I was fortunate to, enough to attend last year that was in Riverside. And at that conference, um, I was able to present a little bit about chronic disease prevention and, and the work that's going on with our alliance. And next slide, when I was on um, the presentation panel, I did share this slide um, at the conference. And it really became kind of an aha moment, I think, for environmental health and chronic disease together where we were realizing as far as factors that influence health, being able to access health care is about 10% of the equation. Your uh, genetic code is about 20%, but where you live and your behaviors is, is a whopping 70%. So it really became obvious to us that, that we need to collaborate between environmental health and chronic disease. And that was where I was able to, to meet Angelo, and it was clear he just had a very strong vision on how, um, what these connections were and how we could accomplish that together. So after that conference, we've had a few meetings, and both are very interested in seeing if we can move this forward. Our Public Health Alliance leadership has identified this as one of our priority areas for the year this year, and so we're very excited to kind of to welcome you for the launch of this collaboration. Um, and we couldn't start it off a better way than having Angelo um, kind of frame this whole idea for us. So just quickly, um, a brief bio for Angelo. Most of you probably know him. He is Director of Environmental Health for the County of Los Angeles, Department of Public Health. And he was previously Director of Environmental Health and Safety for LA Unified School District, where he led reforms in the areas of school emergency planning, sustainable building design, and regulatory review of proposed school sites. His work in environmental health began in 1973 and he's held positions in both public and private sectors, and has carried out a range of assignments dealing with the assessment and control of environmental health risks throughout the state of California. Angelou has served on the US EPA's Children Health Protection Advisory Committee and the CDC's Board of Scientific Counselors. He's a member of the California Conference of Directors of Environmental Health, and he currently is leading uh, the department's work in reducing the health impacts of climate change while promoting the development of healthy, sustainable, and resilient communities. His leadership in the environmental health, health field has been recognized by the California Legislature, US EPA, the California League of Conservation Voters, and the National Environmental Health Association. So it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Angelo, and um, thank you so much for kicking off our collaboration. I'll turn it over to you. Angelo, are you able to unmute yourself with a star six? Hello? There, we hear you, we hear you now. Great. Uh, I, I picked up the handset, too. So, uh, Tracy, thank you very much for uh, your remarks. I think you did a very good job of, um, of explaining, uh, you know, exactly how we came together and what, what we've got ahead. We're, we're really scratching the surface right now in terms of how environmental health and chronic disease prevention can uh, cooperate uh, to build healthier communities. 
And what we really want to do today is open up that dialogue uh, to a, a larger group, those of you that are on the call today. So I want to thank you again, Tracy. And um, environmental health um, has had about a century of working together with our partners in public health, but the vast majority of that has been on the control of communicable diseases. Those of us in in CCDEH, which is the California Conference of Directors of Environmental Health, and many of our colleagues outside the state of California really do see uh, today the value of expanding our work to address other factors. And I think that slide that you made reference to, Tracy, was a perfect one, a slide that really demonstrates uh, how intricately involved our environment is in shaping our health. So, um, with all the national attention now on prevention, we think it was only a matter of time for us to engage with our counterparts here on the phone in chronic disease prevention. Um, two or three years ago, a small group of us within CCDEH started asking how we could best join this work. And some of us were fortunate to have uh, real champions within our local health departments. I know many of you in the chronic disease prevention group uh, know very well uh, Dr. Paul Simon and Jean Armbruster, but these are two leaders down here and they were uh, extremely supportive and encouraging for environmental health to step up as was our health officer, Jonathan Fielding. So since then our work group um, has seen the light and we really want to explore our potential roles together with the Alliance and with our respective partners in, in our county or city jurisdictions. By the way, our, our work group is comprised of uh, several members that are on the call today. Liz Posebon from San Diego County, Justin Milan, who's our executive director, Kurt Batson, who's the president of CCDEH, Larry Fay, Santa Barbara County, John Rogers, Sacramento County, and Elizabeth Morgan, uh, who is in ch charge of our Food Safety Policy Committee. And then uh, lastly, Richard Sanchez, who now is in charge of the health care agency, but uh, with Justin and I and several of the others mentioned, um, really want to see us expand into this area. Another visionary in our field that I want to mention before we get started here is Gary Urbeck. Gary brought together the first S3 conference where we were looking at food systems that were not only safe, but secure and sustainable. Now, um, Stacy asked that I, for the, for the benefit of those of you that may not know much about environmental health, to give a brief overview. And I'm going to try a 90 second overview of what we do in environmental health. So if we could just go through uh, several of these slides, I would uh, really appreciate it. And I'll just prompt you as we go along. Uh, let's, let's stand on this slide just for a couple of minutes, though. Uh, local programs in uh, California, environmental health programs, are probably the most progressive in the country. But the risks in our field are continually expanding, and I think most of us who have been in the field for at least a couple decades really can't remember a time where we haven't had two or three or more emerging issues on the horizon. But the opportunities right now with regard to prevention of chronic diseases seem to be especially good for us stepping beyond our conventional roles in environmental health. And our purpose today on this call, which, you know, this is really a beginning, but our purpose is to talk enough about the potential things we could do together so that we see the connections and that we are committed to going further to explore how we uh, can develop appropriate roles that support one another in this area. So um, let me just uh, start by saying that in environmental health, um, it, it, we're probably best known, and we can advance to the next slide, we're probably best known for keeping kitchens clean and a posting of letter grades. I think in the last several weeks, um, we've had quite a bit of notoriety, though, on our efforts to keep latex gloves on those that make sushi and uh, work as bartenders but that really doesn't reflect uh, enough of what we do. So um, next slide, please. We're gonna just blast through these quickly. Housing institutions, we get involved, and these are all regulatory roles that we have here. We get involved in solid waste management. Uh, next slide, uh, water wells and small water systems. Wastewater treatment systems 
cross-connection prevention. This is uh, preventing connections between our potable and uh, wastewater systems. Next slide, swimming pools, recreational waters. The next slide, preparedness. And uh, our, our county is fortunate to have a, a really excellent team of uh, environmental health professionals that comprise strike teams. Um, we're probably the only jurisdiction in California, but there are several others that are uh, joining uh, in on that. Next slide. Uh, we're also unique in that we have a very good toxics epidemiology program and environmental hygiene uh, program. Next slide, childhood lead poisoning prevention. Next, radiation management. We manage uh, vectors that uh, transmit disease. We regulate food carts, taco trucks, and street vending. And I know for, for those of you that are in environmental health, I know the picture on the right is not a, a good portrayal of legal street vending, but it is nevertheless a portrayal of what goes on in our jurisdiction. Uh, next slide. There are a few other programs. We really didn't have time to mention them all, but cottage foods, body art, garment manufacturing. And I'm going to stop there even though I'm leaving out a number of our programs. But there's the uh, field of environmental health in 90 seconds. So um, let's advance to the next slide. I think uh, those of us that have been working in uh, protecting public health uh, and preventing communicable diseases really understand the gravity of our work in this area. And together with our counterparts in public health, we've seen enormous progress in the last century. If you look at this chart here from 1900 to 2000, we see that the life expectancy at birth went from just over 47 years to almost 77 years. So that 30-year gain <clears throat> is uh, substantial. And it's thought that 25 of that 30-year gain was attributable to, not to um, health care, but advances in public health. So clearly the introduction of vaccines, antibiotics, and improved nutrition is a big factor there that um, a number of you on the phone can share in, but improvements in sanitation, clean water, food safety, and housing conditions, uh, you know, take the lion's share of those 25 years. <clears throat> so um, that's a lot of uh, progress in just 100 years, but our work in these areas, by the way, the communicable diseases will, will always be essential because the minute we take our focus off, uh, we see that conditions that we've put in place over the last 100 years can degrade very rapidly. And we're reminded of this every time we have a flood or a wildfire or a sewer line breakage, how, uh, how vital it is that these systems be maintained. And so it sort of guarantees our future work well into the future. But um, despite that 30-year gain, I think many of us realize in the public health field that not, not all is well with the health of Americans. And we've heard a lot about that. I think, uh, let's mo move to the next slide. I think that uh, there is clearly a, a greater focus on most individuals within our field on chronic disease prevention because we realize that if we're going to continue to make gains in uh, life expectancy, but most importantly, improving the quality uh, of the lives that we do lead, <clears throat> we're going to have to tackle the chronic diseases, which currently, if I remember right from, from all the uh, advice I get from uh, Dr. Simon, greater than 70% of all deaths today are attributable to uh, the chronic diseases. And 75% of the annual health care expenditures are also in support of uh, treatment for those chronic diseases. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, if there was a most important slide for those of us that are trying to understand why the environment is so important, it's this one. And, and this is kind of like a single slide that uh, encapsulates uh, some very sage advice I've gotten from my partners in public health. And, and the way they describe it is that we can either treat disease, we can prevent disease by influencing the choices that individuals make, or we can go even further upstream and bring about changes in the physical environment. I think what's also listed there is the last one are the social determinants. And I think many of us here recognize that if we're really going to significantly tackle the challenges of today, 
we're going to have to tackle those very tough social determinants as well. But um, just for the moment, let's uh, consider the environment and what specific changes we could make to the environment to improve public health. <clears throat> so let's uh, go to the next slide, the factors driving investments in public health. When I said a few minutes ago that I thought we were at a very unique time, it's because of a, a convergence of a number of different factors. And uh, I'm just really amazed at how these factors are all operating today at once. But I think it gives us real optimism. Think about these. Number one, we do have a recognized crisis in healthcare, And there is at least a modicum of, of, of attention now toward prevention in terms of funding. But that, that recognition in itself is, is very important, and I think it sort of sets a, a stage. Um, we're, we're also seeing continued investments in preparedness, not related to our health care crisis, but related to national security concerns, <clears throat> and also more and more every day late related to the uh, increase in frequency duration of, um, of emergencies, natural disasters, and uh, our, our forecasts are that with climate change, we're going to see much more of that. Um, there is a sustainability crisis. And uh, just think first about climate and the fact that our energy systems have not really operated sustainably. And um, we have very real evidence of uh, water in uh, non-sustainability within the Southern California area and throughout our state right now. These are two um, clear uh, elements of the sustainability crisis that we find ourselves in. And it sets the stage again for action and really an urgency to act. We also have uh, a growing recognition among the other sectors, land use sector and the other sectors, that the decisions that we make in planning our communities have a real impact on health. We can either degrade health or we can improve health by these planning decisions. And then lastly, the public seems to be waking up here in a way that no prior generation has to wanting to chart out their behaviors and their actions and their living environments that will make them healthier as they age. And I think these factors together give me real room um, for optimism. And <clears throat> I think this is what is catching a lot of our colleagues in environmental health that we could play a role given the fact that these stars are lining up. <clears throat> now let's go to the next slide. There are a couple of keys to success that I think are also operating. When you're dealing with a complex set of issues that are referenced on the previous slide, it becomes very evident to us that collaboration among the public health disciplines and with all the other sectors is essential. Now, do we recognize that? We certainly do in public health. Um, and I think we can get others in the other sectors to see that as well. But collaboration is going to be vital here. We're not going to solve even a fraction of this work if we're keeping our minds solely on what our work is as it's defined today. So collaboration is big, and I think um, we're, we're hearing a lot more about people's commitment to doing that, breaking the silos and, and working together on these issues because they're very complex. Um, the range of issues have already engaged uh, so many different sectors and that um, they're not well organized right now, but they're all scratching the surface and they're looking for leadership. I know when I think back about climate change uh, six or seven years ago when I came back to the health department, actually it's been about six and a half years ago, um, there was not very, a very strong presence from the public health community. It was something that was run by the State Air Resources Board, and it was looked at really as an air pollution problem. I think today we recognize that if we're going to tackle this problem, we've got to get and enlist the support of the general public and of local governments across the country. And the only way we're going to do that is by getting the general public to understand that these um, these issues uh, are really public health at their core. And so I think there's a real opportunity for us to step up. And I think it's, it's not only an opportunity, it's probably a, a need for us to step up uh, in this work. Um, 
I think also another useful way of looking at our work is to group them under four broad themes. And I'll show you what those are in just a minute. Um, the solutions to any one of the problems generally has co-benefits in, in multiple other areas, which is another uh, great thing. And there is a sense of urgency that I think many people see today. So is there room for optimism? I, I certainly think there is. So let's go to the next slide. Now, I mentioned that our, um, our actions fall under four broad themes, one that I've left out today, but um, it, it's because I'm not going to really focus on it, but one that, uh, that we would add to the bottom here is consumer protection. That's another area that we really see uh, the need for uh, government action on, and uh, there, are, are, there are shared benefits uh, in that work as well, but we won't talk about that today. So um, first off, preparedness, sustainability, and healthy communities. Those are the three. Now, what I really see uh, is that public health is already engaged in leading the way in, in all three of these themes. These are strong environmental themes, each of them, but public health, not environmental health, is really on board and they're leading the way. So when we say that we can reshape our local environments to improve health, that is, that is really taking our profession, our environmental health profession, and expanding it to, to what, it's, what it really means at its roots. But it is substantially different from the conventional programs that we've been focusing on. But to do that in the healthy communities area, I have found within LA County, all I need to do is follow the lead of the, of, of the direction that's been set out by our folks in chronic disease prevention because they really have a connection with what are the keys to developing healthy communities. And I think many of us in the state in environmental health will find that same trend within our county departments of public health because they have this and they've got a real grip on this. Um, I think, as I've mentioned, the co-benefits are very big across all three of these so that if you're working on an item and we're gonna look at some specific, uh, some specific things here in a minute, but if you're working on um, one of these, you're going to find that it has uh, big returns in, in the others as well. And maybe just the, the first example I'll use there, that when we can reduce our reliance on non-renewable energy, we'll increase, uh, you know, and increase our dependency on renewables. It, that'll do a couple of things. In the sustainability area, it's going to um, definitely reduce greenhouse gas emissions and and uh, help uh, mitigate the rate at which our climate is changing. But the second thing that will occur is that if we can um, achieve those reductions in greenhouse gases by not only reducing our reliance on petroleum fuels, but getting out of the car as much as we use the car today and using public transportation, will um, not only reduce air pollution, that has an impact on chronic health, but will also increase people to walk from the various modes of alternative travel. If they're not jumping in a car, they're uh, walking to the bus station or they're uh, using their bicycle, the younger generation at least, using their cycles to get around. So these are um, some examples of some co-benefits. Next slide, please. So I wanna now talk about each of these and some areas um, by the way, the first two, preparedness and uh, sustainability, we will not focus on that for our talk because we've only got, you know, another 15 minutes. And um, I'm going to mention them because it is part of the bigger picture here, but we're going to focus on the third one, healthy communities. But just so that we present the framework here uh, that we are utilizing in L.A., uh, preparedness, sustainability, and healthy communities. So the first one, preparedness. We're uh, preparing for natural disasters and, and other events. We're preparing for uh, uh, technological disasters. This uh, photo shown here is of the Fukushima plant, a good example. And then we're preparing for acts of terrorism, man-caused uh, uh, acts uh, or disasters. And that's, of course, the Boston Marathon. Um, our preparedness is becoming even more relevant today in the area of um, sustainability because preparedness does jump into sustainability when we talk about preparing for our changing climate. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, but 
Uh, I wanted to at least mention that in the area of preparedness, we're working on all fronts here and have been for some years. Next slide. In sustainability, climate is, and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is the, the primary objective, but water sustainability is also a very serious problem for us. Our groundwater resources, the, the extent to which our water supplies are currently uh, contaminated, and uh, the unreliability of our basic drinking water systems in many small communities and uh, soon to be larger communities throughout the state of California. This is a real crisis for us, and we have to work together in an integrative fashion to properly manage uh, water and uh, make our water use sustainable. So now um, let me move on to the third of these uh, disciplines or themes, and that's healthy communities. And I want to talk about maybe one example in each of these that are shown here. There are several others, but we're going to talk about these three specifically today. Healthy design, access to healthy foods, and toxic risk reduction, that is cumulative risk reduction within our communities. Um, <clears throat> okay, now let's move to the next slide. And we're going to focus now on the first part of that, healthy design, and that is uh, the um, planning decisions do, in fact, impact health. I think we've all seen the consequences of poor planning. We can look very many areas, many communities throughout our various jurisdictions and, and see that when we don't plan properly, we're sort of saddled with these problems that are listed here. I won't read through them, but we're saddled with those problems you know, not temporarily, in some cases for extended periods of time, lifetimes, maybe a, a couple generations of lifetimes. So where we can reshape the environment that has been poorly planned, we need to take every opportunity to do that. But more urgent than anything else we can do is change the way in which we plan our cities. And that's real tough. We're going to have to do this at the same time we're trying to, at the same time we're flying this airplane, we're going to have to try to uh, re-engineer it so that um, we do move toward a healthier future for all of our communities, even those that are currently saddled with poor planning decisions of the past. Now, let's move to the next slide. I want to do a second element here in the healthy design, and that is an example of uh, potential work that we're uh, very much in uh, planning to be engaged in, and that is the revitalization of the LA River. I want you to look at the top slide there, and that is the way the LA River looks today. Those of you that, uh, certainly a lot of you from Southern California, that's a very familiar sight. It's not very inviting. In fact, it's dangerous. If you look at the bottom slide, that is what the plans are for converting the LA River into a place where there'll be restoration of natural environments and where people can actually use the LA River, can recreate in the LA River, can gain peace from the LA River. And um, I, I use this first one because we can't escape this in environmental health even if we weren't interested in realizing this vision. And the reason we can't escape it is because as environmental health professionals, we know there are problems associated with this, this transition. There are issues that have to be dealt with. I'm, con I'm convinced we can deal with all of them, but there are real issues there. We have portions of the LA River today where, I mean, we know what goes into the LA River, but we have people recreating in the rivers now. We have kids walking through the rivers. We have people swimming in the rivers. And there's a real question about the quality of the water of those rivers. So we have to focus much more there and see what can we do so that these other beneficial uses of these forgotten waterways as we begin to develop them, that, w that our public health concerns keep abreast with the development so that we don't run into a, a disaster later where we make these investments and we can't utilize them or we can't without substantial delay. So we have to be thinking ahead, and this is why we're working with our LA Watershed Council right now to determine based on baseline water quality, what can we be doing to ensure that that water is safe for limited contact that will occur as you make this uh, river much more inviting than it's been in the past. So that's one example in that area. Let's now move to the second area in um, healthy communities, which is access to healthy foods. And I would say that the first example that I'd like to just mention briefly is supporting innovation. Um, 
we are at our very core in the environmental health field, and it really has to do with the, the length of time that we've been around. We've been around long enough in environmental health to have developed uh, codes and regulations that minimize the potential for the spread of communicable diseases. So with that mindset of regulation, it's sometimes hard for us to embrace innovation because innovation may not be uh, may not be uh, uh, welcomed by the existing regulations. And if we can't find a regulation or a way in which to regulate a certain activity, we, we get very uncomfortable. I'm just speaking now as a regulator. So I think here too, we have to look ahead and we have to realize that innovation is not our enemy here. Not if we are subscribing to this broader view of what a healthy community provides. It not only provides safe foods, it provides healthy foods, right? We can develop fast foods throughout LA and we can make sure they're very safe for you in the conventional term of the word, but they may not be healthy for you. And we may prevent you from getting a foodborne illness, but you're on this path of unsustainable living and headed toward uh, chronic disease. So we have to find ways in which we can su support healthier and more innovative ways. So here's a list here we certainly want to see urban agriculture here listed uh, for the LA area, which is, is pretty limited for us, school and community gardens and culinary gardens that would uh, service food establishments. Um, these require uh, support from environmental health because they all have the potential to make people sick if they're not done properly. But we have to find ways to uh, make it work. So we're developing in consultation with our partners in chronic disease here in um, in Los Angeles County. We're developing guidance for the use of community gardens, pre-screening the soils, and also how we operate those gardens so that we don't create other unintended side effects. Shared kitchens. Um, this was a no-no not too long ago, and now we're realizing that uh, this is something that we've got to move toward. So we're trying to develop a new way of looking at shared kitchens. We've worked with a couple of very innovative operators. We're working with two of them now that are, that are constructing, uh, with our assistance, what we're referring to as multi-tenant food facilities. So these aren't shared kitchens, but they're a facility that's constructed by a single owner with multiple uh, if you will, food facilities within that have common areas for, say, cooking, but separate areas, segregated areas for uh, the storing and refrigeration and, and uh, other uh, things that can't really be shared. And then the expansion of our farmers markets. We'll, we'll, trip over some, we'll trip over ourselves and we'll do triple somersaults if we can expand the proliferation of farmers markets and for those that are participating in. We've done a lot of work there, but there's a lot more work that we can do. And um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is another one in the category of access to healthy foods, and I want to tell you just a brief story here. We had, um, and by the way, I'm not I'm not suggesting to anyone that this is a healthy food vendor because it's not. That is not a lawful uh, piece of equipment. But it nevertheless is uh, uh, vendors that are operating on the streets of LA today. So the story is this. We had a couple um, visitors from the LA Food Policy Council uh, just a few weeks ago. And I think these four members from the council came in and uh, they said to us, look, we've got a, we're working with the LA City uh, on the LA City Street Vending Ordinance, which will legalize food vending and vending of other sorts on uh, s sidewalks and, and public streets, public areas. Whereas now in the city of LA, that, that is not lawful. So their question was, how do we convert all this non-conforming uh, equipment and operators? How do we convert them? Because our goals are, and they had, he had three of them, we want to create local jobs, we want to provide healthier food options, and we want to make our local communities more vibrant. And we looked at them, and, and those of us that are working on this within our county said, bingo, that makes sense to us. We want to help you on this. We just have to be realistic, though, 
about how much of this existing equipment can be converted. We don't think much of it can. So our challenge right now is to go from non-compliant equipment and operators that don't have the knowledge of how to operate and to provide a means for them to operate lawfully in areas of the city where they have not ever been able to operate. And um, so this ordinance is steaming down the road and we're trying to catch up. It's not only going to be humongous in terms of the workload because we do expect hundreds of uh, applications, maybe on a weekly basis. And we're, we're trying to be realistic every, with everyone that there will be a couple of cho choke points here. But what I think we did with the, um, the advocates for the food, safety, uh, the food Policy Council was to explain to them, look, there are some real problems here and we're not going to be able to work through all of them. They totally understood that. And we've got a real partnership with those individuals working now to make this as successful as we can. Okay, um, I'm going to go very quickly at one last item, just another example here. And this is focused on risk reduction in highly burdened communities. We have many areas of our county and throughout California, we've got areas that are communities that are already highly burdened due to toxic exposures. So we're launching a pilot effort where we will create a priority list of communities that have the greatest ranking. And this is using the uh, recent ranking tool that was put out by the state of California that looked both at uh, environmental factors within these communities as well as population vulnerabilities. And uh, we're going to initiate pilot projects in two of these most highly burdened communities in our county to see what we can do to uh, reduce cumulative risk within these areas. This is the first community-based effort that our department will be undertaking, at least in the environmental health area. So our focus will be on facilities, but we're going to be looking to make sure that we're not only sufficiently regulating facilities, but that in totality those facilities will, all, the regulation of those facilities will also result in a reduction in the risk. Uh, there's a lot to talk about on this, and uh, maybe we'll be able to hand it during Q&As, but those of you that want to talk further about this, let me know because um, we have a lot to say. Next slide. The potential risk reduction measures are listed here, and I'm not going to go through them right now, but these are things that may be appropriate in communities that are already highly burdened. A lot of times just notifying the communities themselves and the agencies that are working these issues. In many instances, we have state regulatory authorities that are the lead. We want them to know that these facilities that they're regulating have a cumulative impact on local communities, and we want to work with them to strengthen the, their priorities and their range of uh, remedies so that the overall result is a reduction in cumulative risk. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's pass this slide up, go to the next one. These are the 10 highest scoring zip codes in LA County. Uh, we hope to have new data that will be oriented at the census tract level, but this is, should be no surprise to any of us that live in the Southland that these that score highest in terms of their cumulative toxic risk are also some of the most challenging for other factors, for other reasons that, uh, that help determine health. But these are, these are the list, and we're going to pick two local communities within the top of the list here. Next, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, go by this because we're running out of time. Let's skip this one. Okay, I want to make, let's go back one more. Two quick points here. What are the constraints to the initiatives that we're implementing in LA? What are those? I mentioned briefly one of them already, which is that we, we are working within the regulatory paradigm. It's very familiar to us. We generally have enforceable requirements. There is a responsible party that can be um, brought, we can bring, bring to bear effort on the responsible party to take action to reduce the risk. Um, and if there's noncompliance, it results in enforcement, and we do have enforcement rental, uh, remedies. And these programs are typically funded the Health and Safety Code gives us the ability to recover our costs from the responsible party. Now, this particular um, paradigm that we work in has been effective in the past, but it doesn't do enough. It doesn't go far enough in those areas that we've been talking about. And um, 
you know, our our um, our our, uh, our efforts to support a broader public health mission have to, have to be dependent on our ability to work outside of this regulatory paradigm. So I want to go to the next slide and talk about a new paradigm that we're defining here within LA County, and a number of our counterparts are also moving in this area. And this is where there may not be a responsible party, but we are nevertheless sensitive to the broader public health mission. We've, we fully consider in our, the, the, in our working uh, health in our decisions and on our policies. Health in all policies, for those of us on the phone here, begins in our backyard. So for those of us as regulators, we have to think about how our current regulatory policies may not give a commensurate return on the investment and may in fact operate counter to some of the broader goals we're looking to achieve in public health. It is also a paradigm that influences the decisions and the policies of other sectors. It educates the public to become, uh, to make better choices uh, for their health, and it works to improve health as well as protect it. Regulators are very good at protecting health. We're now moving into an area where we can actually be a part of improving the health status of, uh, of our population. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, and I, uh, with that, Tracy, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I think we've left sufficient time, but uh, sorry if I've gone over a few minutes. Angelo, that was just an outstanding presentation. Thank you so much for that. I think you really set uh, the foundation of what we're looking to explore. Um, I'd like to open it up. I know it's going to be a little bit tricky with some of the, the sound and uh, the muting, but I would like to open it up for any particular um, questions that folks might have for Angelo. And then I'd like to leave a few minutes at the end for us to uh, think about how we can more intentionally uh, work together and explore some of these issues. Um, and explore this new paradigm together so that we can try to support each other um, for future of public health. So let me please open it up for any questions or comments that folks have uh, for Angelo's uh, talk. You'll have to, I think, hit the star six, and if you can please just mute yourself after the question, that will help. Hi, it's Justin here in Sacramento. I also wanted to commend you and Angela, for a great kickoff, and hopefully it will be the first of many. Um, I just wanted to share a thought. We had a discussion with Dean Peterson and you folks on last week about how we can engage environmental health more. And I know, Angela, you and others have, have realized, Liz, as well, that there's a concern within the, the broader ranks of environmental health regulators and some of the directors that this is going to involve too much mission creep and that and even though Angelo mentioned the importance of maintaining our focus on our principal responsibilities, um, there is that concern. I'm wondering if there's some way that we can fairly systematically identify those broader issues, many of which you touched on, that are closest to our direct uh, immediate mission and prioritize them and then others where we'd have a secondary role, wouldn't necessarily take the lead, but we could maybe play a supportive role. So that way we can get some structure around how we take this to the next step, at least within CCDH and the environmental health arena. Justin, I think that's an excellent point, and it is a reality that we have to deal with. You know, in the sustainability theme, or in the sustainability area and in the preparedness area, there is money there. I think we've got opportunities in those areas to uh, continue to get funding for those two areas. In the uh, access to healthy foods, it may be one of these areas where it's limited, and what we really need to do is sort of sharpen our pencils, come up with our guidance, and leverage the activities of our counterparts in chronic um, disease control. So leverage is really one of the operative words here uh, because we can't take on new roles, especially in today's economic crisis, but we can carve out a very narrow piece that we're vital for, which is developing guidance and actually using that as a lever to move and influence the decisions of the other sectors and our partners in public health. 
Right. Thanks, Angela. I think that's helpful. And this is Tracy. I just would like to jump in as well. When we had some earlier calls with just the chronic disease side, um, we were talking about some areas that I think are more closely related maybe as a starting point, and some of those have to do with um, school gardens, salad bars, and I think there's a real kind of immediate opportunity to look at some of the best practices that have happened, to talk about where some of the barriers may have um, may be, and some solutions and, and best practice examples that can be shared so that we start having a more uniform kind of understanding, I think, about how we can um, broaden the opportunities for access to healthy food. Excellent. Yeah, I think uh, this is Angelo again, and I think the uh, community gardens and uh, other innovative food systems, you know, I, I want to use just the cottage foods as a, as a teaser here because uh, our CCDEH group under Elizabeth Morgan's leadership really pulled together and developed in very short order guidance on how we would regulate cottage food operators effective January 1. Now, that was all done with existing resources because the power of our association through CCDEH allows us to work on these issues. Once the program is actually developed and the guidance is there, then if we have an ongoing regulatory role, which we will in some of these programs, then there are, we can use our health and safety code provisions to assess a fee to support that regulatory role. But there are many other areas where we need to provide guidance and let others do the heavy lifting in terms of ongoing regulation. And uh, there are a number of examples we could talk about, but um, I think we have to be really clear about walking that, uh, that fine line. Uh, Justin, again, I just wanted to mention that CCDH Okeha will actually is sponsoring a bill that will be introduced before the end of this week to streamline or, or recognize community gardens, urban gardens, school gardens, and to try to find a way to reduce uh, the regulatory burden on those gardens provided they uh, follow best management practices. So we are taking a very strong active and proactive position on that particular issue. And this, this is Tracy. That's another wonderful example. We'd love to hear more about that legislation and how can we support that. I think it might be nice to be able to, to have chronic disease weigh in in support of, of that, some of those um, recommendations as well. Sure. Thank you. I think another piece of this is kind of education and are there opportunities either in uh, environmental health or in chronic disease just in terms of education and the linkages that, that Angelo so eloquently described. I think that you know, there's some work that we could be um, helping with at the local level to even just build the capacity and understanding to bridge some of these things as well because as you said, it is a new paradigm. So we have a, a few more minutes. Are there any other comments or questions before we uh, discuss some potential next steps? We've got everyone intimidated now with the, <laughs> with the star six. <laughs> we'll try to figure out something better in the future. So um, I guess just in terms of um, a wrap up, one of the things that Angelo and, and Liz, Justin, and, and Kurt and I had talked about was the idea of maybe continuing for the next five months to ha conduct these types of webinars jointly together um, where we could plan out maybe, as Justin recommended, maybe some of the more closely related um, connections, but to be able to really talk about some of the best practices, some of the promising practices, and how we can maybe work together more efficiently and, and reduce some of the um, barriers that might exist. So we are proposing what we would like to do is host for the next five months, we have this, um, this one hour a month, and we would really like to invite you and your colleagues to join these calls so that we can have more of this discussion. We can 
uh, identify what this new paradigm is and how at the local level and at the regional level and hopefully even at the state level we can really support this and, and move this collaboration together um, much more effectively. And so I, what is, do you want to get that last slide, Mina or Carla? We are asking if you, if you are interested in that, that um, you contact us. We do have the attendee list here. So if, if people don't object, maybe we can reach out and, and send an invitation to you. Our next call is um, March 18th from 2 to 3. And we have it at the same uh, day uh, and, and time of the month, uh, each month. And we have this commitment to each other that we were hoping to um, do this for five calls and to kind of judge from there um, how it's going and how we can improve that. So that would be an invitation. Um, Angelo, I don't know if you wanted to add anything more to that. Uh, just that uh, for those that are a little uncomfortable about, um, you know, the, <laughs> the challenge ahead of us, I think we have to go slowly. And I love the idea of calls over the next five months because it gives us a chance to really make um, – a good plan on how we're going to approach this. I've, I've uh, looked ahead enough to know we're expanding in these areas. It's, it's undeniable. That's where we're headed, and many jurisdictions are already, already headed in that direction. The key is how we leverage the limited resources that we have, but we will be expanding into these areas. And um, the only thing I'd like to say or uh, close on here is we have real reason to be optimistic here we're going to turn things around in terms of uh, the uh, proliferation of chronic diseases. Uh, we know what's required. We understand that. And together, we're going to work together to uh, reduce those exposures that are contributing to this problem. Great. On, on that optimistic note, which I share with you, um, I want to thank you so much, Angelo. That was just really the best talk on this subject that I've heard. And it's going to be a great resource for, for all of our colleagues. And um, we'd just like to thank everyone who joined our call, took the time. We hope that you'll join us again next month so we can continue this dialogue. And thank you so much for your time. We look forward to working with you. Bye-bye.